Hi, Tyler Stallman. Before, I've shown you guys the desk setups that I use for my professional photo and video production, but today we're gonna do something a little more casual, comfortable, and minimal. This is my new work from home desk setup that meets the needs of a professional, but also keeps it simple. And it's sponsored by Logitech. Now let's rewind to a couple of years ago when we got this bungalow and started renovating it. It was a massive transformation from what it used to be. And you might've been following along on Instagram. It's at Dover House. We've shown every detail of what we've done and there's still tons more work to be done. So follow us over there to see how it turns out. But for now, I just wanted a space where I could get some work done while we're here. So we started setting up this office. We were starting out with just an empty room. There's really no shape to it. The only thing we had is this desk from EQ3 and we knew we were gonna design the workspace around that. So my wife Anya had the idea of putting some shelves on the wall. So I invited my dad over so I could film him helping me install this rail mount desk system. I'd already worked with these kind of shelves before. They're extremely versatile for putting into different shapes on the wall, not too hard to install. The studs weren't quite at the right distance apart so we used anchors to secure it into the wall. Once the shelves are up, we started filling them with books and plants and knickknacks. And throughout the house, we've got a colorful pastel palette. So lots of greens and pinks and purples and blues. So we're gonna follow through with that in this room. Setting up the desk, I spent more time than usual on cable management, which was totally worth it. Turned out great. I just used some double-sided tape on the power bar so that it would attach to the bottom of the table. I got a long cable runner, cut it in half, and attached both of those to the middle underside of the table, ran the cords through. And for any desk setup, I think it's helpful to see the truth. So this is what it really looks like in the back. It's still pretty good, I think. From the front, you can't even tell it's there. And then once we added all the tech, this is how it turned out. For my main computer, it's got to be a laptop because we travel a lot, we move around to different sets and different working locations. And the M1 Max MacBook Pro has been a dream computer for me. And something that's pretty amazing about Apple's lineup right now is you can get that M1 Max chip in whichever computer body fits your needs. So the 14 inch MacBook Pro would be just as fast or the Mac Studio, whatever works for you. It is incredibly powerful, whatever your production needs happen to be. And if you stick around till the end of the video, I'll include a playlist comparing all of the modern Macs and how you can decide which M1 computer is right for your needs. And I'm putting this MacBook on top of the 12 South Curve laptop stand. It comes in black or white. It has really solid build quality and it looks great on the desk. In any setup where the computer is sitting right on the desk, I do recommend trying to elevate it at least a little bit. So if there's ever a spill, it's not gonna affect the computer itself. Now through a single Thunderbolt cable, that MacBook Pro is connected to the Apple Studio display. It delivers 96 watts of power to charge any MacBook that you plug into it, and it serves as a USB hub. For most people with a normal budget, this is the best large screen display that you can get for a Mac. Of course, there's the XDR if you really wanna spend a lot of money, and there are many other 4K options, which don't worry, everybody already told me about in the comments of my full review. I know they exist, but on Mac OS, it does a much better job upscaling to perfect two times resolution. And so a 5K display is the only thing that does that at 27 inches. But don't take my word for it. Over on Twitter, I posted an article from Mark Edwards that does a great job of breaking all of this down. It shows the different monitors that are available with similar specs so you don't have to tell me in the comments. So I'm gonna stick with either the Studio Display or the LG 5K Ultrafine, which is what I'm using now because the Studio Display is still a review unit, shipping delays are pretty extreme. And the only difference is that I think for my Studio Display, I'm gonna be ordering one that has the adjustable height stand because I don't know, it, it's crazy that it's not included in the Studio Display at this price. Have you ever had that thing where you buy something new and suddenly you're seeing it everywhere? That's what happened with our desk chair. So this is based on a design called the Cheska. We ordered it from the Bay, but it turns out it was designed in 1928 by Marcel Breuer. It's an incredibly famous piece that is absolutely everywhere, but it actually was never copyrighted. So there are knockoffs available all over the place which ours is one of, but I absolutely love it. In front of the monitor, I rolled out a 30 by 70 centimeter Logitech desk mat. To control everything, I'm using the Logitech MX Keys mini keyboard and the MX Anywhere 3 mouse. I've been using the larger MX Keys and MX Master mouse for years now. Logitech is sponsoring this video, but I've been buying their mice and keyboards for as long as I can remember. The smaller keyboard felt perfect for this more casual computer setup. 
The aluminum finish matches all of the other hardware and it just fits right in. This is the MX Keys Mini specifically for Mac. So this does have the function keys that you'd expect on any Macintosh keyboard. Control, option keys are all where I want them. And those keys feature backlighting with proximity sensors. So if you're a darker environment, you can always see what you're typing. In my space, that wasn't the highest priority. So I actually disabled the backlight and that gives me up to five months battery life on a single charge. And that was easy to change in the Logi Options software where you can do all sorts of different updates to your hardware. And I also modified those brightness control keys to turn up and down my monitor brightness instead of the keyboard backlighting. And another one of the media buttons that I really like is the instant mute feature, which is especially helpful when I'm podcasting so that, you know, if I need to cough to the side, my audience isn't gonna notice. And alongside the keyboard is the MX Anywhere 3. So I usually am using the MX Master, which is a lot bigger, and I just wanted a change this time. So I went for the smaller travel options. This is actually probably gonna end up in my backpack a lot of the time, but the Anywhere 3 has almost all of the same important features of the MX Master crammed into a much smaller mouse. For example, the scroll wheel still features the same adjustable resistance as in the MX Master, so you can either give it a little bit of a clicking resistance or you can press the button below it and it'll just spin freely. Clicking down on the scroll wheel gives you the middle click that is essential for any 3D software or color grading in Resolve. And one thing it's missing that I use all the time on the master is that horizontal scroll wheel on the thumb, but you can still access that. If you just press and hold any of the side buttons, then the scroll wheel shifts to moving from left to right. It's really useful, especially in video editing software. And very importantly, especially for a travel mouse, is that it works on virtually any smooth surface. So you don't need to bring a mouse pad with you anywhere you go, even things like glass. It's still going to track what's going on. I don't know how mice do that, but it's really helpful when you can't necessarily control the environment that you're working in. And something I've come to rely on with Logitech keyboard and mice is they can be connected to up to three machines kind of at the same time. You can just quickly switch back and forth with the buttons on the keyboard and the mouse. So my wife can just sit down with her laptop and connect to this mouse and keyboard without any extra work, or I can start typing right into an iPad that I usually have sitting nearby and I don't need to pull out an additional keyboard just to do that. Most displays, including this one, have pretty mediocre webcams built into them. So let's see how we can make video calls look better. If you spend any amount of time working from home, then the audio and video quality in your Zoom calls is the way of dressing up for work. It's got to look good. We have a kind of decent starting point here, but it could be a lot better. So the microphones in this Apple Studio display are actually excellent. They're much better than most other monitors out there or a lot of computers, but this room is very echoey because there's no furniture in here. It's all hard surfaces so the sound can bounce around. So the first thing we're gonna fix is the audio. And now you're hearing me from the DDV07U. This is a really nice microphone. It could be used for voiceover work or podcasting or whatever you want. And I've got it on this desk just so my Zoom calls are gonna sound better and more professional. A lot of the improvement actually just comes from microphones getting closer to your face. Even this distance between me and the monitor is enough to hear more of that reverb. So when it comes up closer, sounds a lot better. I just have it on a small little stand here I got from Amazon. But another important thing about improving the audio quality is I try to add headphones whenever possible. Usually that's the AirPods Pro and not having the sound coming out of my speakers really helps the Zoom software not have to do more audio processing where it's like removing the sound of other people speaking and trying to do that noise canceling. Now that our audio is better, let's do something about the image. This is a kind of minimal setup, so I'm not gonna add a bigger webcam like when I'm streaming the podcast, I'm using a full size DSLR camera or the C70, but here I just wanna use what's built into the monitor and I just need to add some light. And this is the real reason for this Ikea desk lamp over here is it is great at adding some fill into my face. It is soft light, importantly, so it's not a spotlight creating shadows. The bulbs on there really help diffuse the light that's coming onto me and it looks natural, helps compete with this big window behind me. Also notice that they are daylight balanced because most of the light in the room is coming from this window nearby. So I'm trying to not compete between two different colors. If you have yellow lights and blue lights, it can make things look a little bit weird. So just whatever the most dominant lighting in the room is, try to match your bulbs to that. And this is looking pretty good, but I think I could still take it one step further. 
And now I've added the Logitech Lytra Glow, and this just helps fill in my face. There's less shadows, less noise because the camera doesn't need to work as hard. And this is kind of my final image. I mean, it doesn't need to look like a YouTube video. This isn't the same type of level of professionalism. I just don't want to distract the people that I'm talking with by bad image quality. But I think we've come a long way here by adding a mic and a couple lights. We've gone from this, which was a little bit echoey, dark, and noisy, and with a few simple additions, we got it looking and sounding like this. I think it's an improvement. In terms of smaller accessories, sitting right beside me, I have the Logitech powered 10 watt charger. This is a wireless charging stand, which works with any Qi compatible devices, including iPhones or AirPods. If you plan to get a charging pad for your desk, I do recommend using one that has a stand because you end up being able to access your phone a lot more easily without picking it up and then stopping the charging. When I have a flat one, I find myself lifting it more often. It gets charged less. And also the stand works with Face ID. I just have to look over and it opens up without picking anything up. To expand our port options, we have the Stay Go USB hub, which gives us all the ports that we're going to need. It's 2022, but we still need USB-A, so it's got a whole bunch of them there. It also has Ethernet, which this house we have wired for fast Ethernet, so I'd rather be able to have that connection that is completely reliable, rather than always, you know, counting on Wi-Fi, which isn't quite as rock solid. It also happens to hide perfectly behind the Apple Studio display, so you don't really know it's there. And if we look at it from behind, you can see there's a little bit of a mess hiding back there, but in regular use, hey, you never see it. And since it adds a second SD card reader, here's a little tip, depending on the size of your internal drive, you can get a big SD card, like say one terabyte, and run Time Machine so that your computer is always backing up to an SD card. You don't have to have an extra hard drive cluttering up the desktop, you can have a backup, that is completely invisible. For all my working projects and files, I've been using SanDisk Extreme portable SSD drives. They're a little bit faster than the Samsungs, but I also really like that they have the rubber coating on the outside. So when I put them in my camera bag, they're not potentially scratching up other gear that I have inside there. Another little tip, I really prefer to plug in any external drives directly to the MacBook rather than to a USB hub or the monitor. For one thing, it removes any potential unreliability with USB hubs or the IO controllers, but also importantly, it doesn't allow you to disconnect the drive as easily. Like if I unplug the monitor, now I've lost the drive as well, and you risk damaging the drive, especially if files are being written back and forth. You'll notice a theme here. I try to dummy proof things from myself, just, you know, just in case. You'll notice that I didn't add any speakers to the desk. And like I said, this is sort of a casual work environment for me. If I'm gonna be mastering audio on bigger monitors, I'm gonna do that at the studio setup. In here, I'm more likely to be watching YouTube videos or listening to podcasts, and the studio display speakers are passable for that. But when I am mastering audio, I'm usually gonna use a pair of Sony MDR7506 headphones. They are a standard in every studio everywhere, so you're making a reliable mix, and they're also not too expensive and sound pretty great. Or let me tell you a little secret, half the time, I'm just using my AirPods. If you're finding it hard to choose from the latest Macs, Here's the playlist where I've reviewed almost all of them. Whether you need a MacBook Pro or an iMac or a Mac Studio, there are good and bad things about all of them and I've tested them with a whole bunch of different creative software. So next, I'll see you in one of those videos. Bye guys.